Have you ever wondered why it is that you can do relatively difficult things with pretty good consistency, but often it's the simplest parts of your life that stop you dead in your tracks and halt your progress? For example, maybe you have a full-time job that's demanding. Maybe you're a full-time college student. Maybe you're raising kids. You do all these things that are objectively extremely hard to do. But when it comes down to these small little details of your life, like doing the dishes, or being consistent with laundry. Those are the things you cannot get done. Believe it or not, I think this all comes down to a simple math equation, and I'm gonna break that down for you today. First, I've got a little story to tell you though, just to kind of exemplify this point that I'm trying to make a little bit. There was a, a Saturday, a couple years back, when I had a lot of pretty intense uh, work and projects planned. I was going to replace some light fixtures, I was gonna clean out the garage. I had, some, I had some significant yard work to do. I had a lot of big stuff planned. And my wife had accidentally double booked herself. She had a doctor's appointment and she had to take the dog to the groomer at the same time. And she asked me, hey, can you take the dog to the groomer? And instantly I felt this feeling inside like, oh no, I can't do that, that's too hard. And that moment, like within three seconds, I was like, why? Am I having this reaction to this simple task? It's gonna be the easiest thing that I do all day long. Why is my first reaction to that thing no? When I've got all these pretty big challenging tasks planned that I'm up for, like I'm ready to do, I'm excited about them. So I did a little digging, I did a little research, and I think I've figured out what it is that creates that discrepancy between our desire to engage in certain behaviors from time to time. So human beings are mammals, right? So when the mammalian brain considers taking an action, there are two variables it assesses, and it does this instantly, and it does this subconsciously, meaning you don't necessarily realize you're considering these things, and it happens before you even have any awareness that you thought about these things. The variables are reward and effort. In other words, when you consider like, should I do this thing or not? In a split second, your brain asks and then answers two questions. How hard will it be for me to do that? And what will I get out of it? And how those two variables relate to one another is what creates or blocks motivation. In other words, whether or not you wanna do something is not simply a function of how important that thing is to you or how difficult that thing is. It is a function of how those two variables interact with one another. If you assess that the effort it will take to engage in a behavior is greater than the reward you will experience if you engage in the behavior, you will not want to do this thing. You will have to exert tremendous willpower to get yourself to engage in this behavior because subconsciously you do not want to do it. That's what was happening to me in my story about taking the dog to the groomers. I had never taken him before. So in my head, the effort was pretty high because I'm not familiar with like the routine, you know, like what door do we go in? What do I say? You know, all the, all the weird stuff you assess when you're about to do something for the first time, things that realistically, you know, are probably not that hard, but since you've never done them before in that specific situation or in that specific context, they feel difficult because you don't know the protocol yet. I didn't know exactly where it was. To be frank with you, my wife likes our dog more than I do. So the reward is also lower for me. I'm more of a cat person as you probably figured out by the cupcake video a while back. That's what it comes down to. If the effort seems like it will exceed the reward, then this behavior is gonna be something we automatically don't want to do. And the only way we're gonna be able to get ourselves to do it is if we override that instant response. If the effort it will require to engage in a behavior and the reward we will experience upon completing the behavior are relatively equal, like there's not a clear winner there, then this is gonna be a behavior that we can engage in, but it's gonna be inconsistent. It's not that we're going to face this huge barrier when we try to do it or this huge inner resistance but we also don't have a high natural drive to engage in the behavior it's just kind of a like eh, i could do that 
I don't necessarily like get super excited about it, but I can do it. So these are going to be things that are really difficult to form habits or routines around. They're going to be things you just do kind of here and there every now and then. If the reward you experience from engaging in a behavior is greater than the effort it will take to engage in the behavior, then this is going to be something that you naturally want to do. It's going to be something that you are kind of pulled towards or called towards and are going to tend to repeat automatically over and over and over again. In fact, once something gets to this point, you would likely have to consciously exert effort to stop yourself from doing this thing because it feels so worth it to your brain that your brain does not want to stop doing this thing and wants to engage in this behavior anytime the option arises. So while that being said, there is a little bit of an adjustment that I have to offer you to that equation we mentioned before, reward versus effort. Because in many cases, the behaviors that we're thinking about engaging in are things we don't do super regularly. And so your brain doesn't necessarily have a lot of actual data on it. Again, take the dog groomers example. I had never taken our dog to the groomers before. So my idea for how much effort that would take and how rewarding it would be was actually a guess because I haven't done it before. So it's actually perception of effort versus perception of reward. That's always true, but it's especially true if we don't know what this thing is like. So any new or inconsistent behavior we are considering engaging in, it's all about perception. That is actually good news because you have some degree of control over your perception. Your perception of effort, your perception of reward are variables that you can modify to change how your brain appraises these tasks. And that is the main focus of what we're going to talk about today. Because if you can modify those variables such that your perception of reward is greater than your perception of effort, you can turn something that is difficult for you or something you don't really want to do or something you kind of have mixed feelings about into something that excites you, into something you want to do over and over and over again, into a habit, into a routine, maybe even into a hobby, something you do for fun that just happens to also be important because of the way these variables play out. So obviously, to make that equation more favorable, there's two things we can do. We can increase our perception of reward, or we can decrease our perception of effort. Both are gonna make it easier for reward to eclipse effort and for that behavior to feel worth it to you. So our perception of reward is primarily based on projections of how this thing is gonna feel based on either other times we've done this thing or if we haven't done this thing very often, we'll use what we think are the most similar experiences we have to project how we think this thing is going to feel. So as you're thinking about doing something, or as you're doing it, depending on the situation, there are a few things that you can do to make that behavior feel more rewarding to you. One is pair that behavior with another behavior that is already rewarding to you. For example, if you are somebody who struggles with folding and putting away laundry, which is a really common one, by the way. Like, I talk about laundry as a psychologist way more than I ever thought I would. This is a big one for a lot of people. So if, if I hit the nail on the head with that example, you're not alone in that. Just want to let you know. If you struggle with folding and putting away laundry, try pairing folding and putting away laundry with something that doesn't get in the way of the activity, that increases the reward you experience when you engage in that behavior. For example, maybe you listen to your favorite podcast while you fold and put away laundry, which hopefully is the psychology of depression and anxiety because that's a pretty great podcast, right? If you only allow yourself to listen to this podcast or, or watch this YouTube channel or listen to this playlist, maybe you make a playlist, whatever it is, if you only do it, while you are folding and putting away your laundry, then your brain, before too long, 
will start to associate those things. And even if your brain doesn't necessarily love the act of folding and putting away laundry itself, it's going to start to appraise that act as more rewarding because it's related to this other thing that is very rewarding to your brain. So you kind of stack these two things on top of each other and it makes you want to move towards that behavior, not because you love the behavior itself, but because it also has this other thing attached to it that you really want. A similar strategy is that you can do something special for yourself after completion of the behavior. I'm just gonna stick with the laundry example for all these just because it's a simple one. After you fold and put away your laundry, maybe you go and get yourself a Starbucks or go and get yourself a snack or something like that. You literally give yourself some kind of tangible reward after you engage in the behavior to increase your brain's perception of reward for that task. It's all subconscious, right? And so even if these two things have nothing to do with each other in reality, if you start to pair them together, either by doing them at the same time or by doing one, then the other, those two concepts begin to become linked in your brain. And then your brain appraises the laundry differently. A third strategy, and this is one that I write a lot about, there's an entire chapter about this in my first book, For When Everything is Burning, if you wanna know more about this one. But a third strategy that I like to use is what I call unlocking your inner John Madden. And I know that might sound a little goofy, just in case you don't know who John Madden is. He was a football announcer, uh, like American NFL football, who was really famous for getting super excited about really minor details of football. So he was a player and a coach before he was an announcer. So he was able to really appreciate minor things that players would do that weren't, you know, big, obvious, like 80 yard touchdown pass and stuff. You see a play that to, you know, to, a, to like a lay person like me, it looks like nothing really happened on that play. And then he'd like zoom in on a lineman's footwork or something. He'd be like, look at this, it was amazing. And I'd be like, oh, that actually is kind of amazing. I would have never caught that without your help, John Madden. If you can unlock your inner John Madden, you can appreciate all the little things you do in a day. Because there's so many things you do that are kind of like that, right? Little versions of like, this play was a three yard run. Nothing big or crazy or dramatic happened or got better as a result of you doing this thing. But what you did to achieve it, you know, even if no one else knows it, you know that you worked very hard to do that. You know that laundry is a struggle for you. You know that your brain kind of doesn't really care that much about putting laundry away. So hear a little announcer voice in your head. Like it, this is super cheesy and weird, I know, but seriously try this. This changed my life, I'm not even kidding. Hear an announcer in your head. You'll have to, you know, kind of prompt it, right? Like encouraging you to put the laundry away. Look at how well he folded that pair of pants just now. Those aren't gonna be creased tomorrow morning. Like, I, I know it's silly, but I'm, I'm not even kidding. Just try it, just try it. You might be shocked at how well this one works. This is one of my, that's why I made an entire chapter in my book. This is one of my favorite tricks in the whole world. It's super effective. Another strategy that I like to use to increase my perception of reward is to notice the completion of my efforts. We often just kind of jump from one task to another in our day, and we don't always take a minute or two to reflect on the success we just had or on the task that we just completed. So once you get your laundry folded and put away, there's a few things that I want you to notice afterwards. And this doesn't have to take a long time, but this is a part that we tend to skip over, and when we skip over it, it decreases the reward from the behavior and makes it harder to do next time. Look at your closet or your dresser or wherever you put the laundry away. Just take a moment to look at it and notice that looks good. That looks really nice how I did that. And before I did that, I didn't like how it looked. So your brain is registering this change that happened. I was unhappy with this thing, now I'm happy with this thing. And what bridged that gap, what created that change was me, it was my efforts. You're taking credit for the hard work that you do. And when you take credit for that hard work that you do, it increases your perception of reward. Or notice, I don't know where your laundry was before. Maybe it was in a hamper. Maybe it was just in a pile. Whatever. There's no judgment. Notice where it was before. 
you probably didn't like how it looked, right? It was probably in a state where every time you walked by it, it bothered you. And you saw it and you're like, ugh, I don't like that, that sucks. Okay, well, now it doesn't look like that anymore. And you know who did that? You. I want you to notice that. And I know you know, like on some level you know, oh, I did my laundry. It's, it's not that you don't understand that. It's that sometimes our brains are kind of dumb. And, and that's everybody, okay? Just to be frank, brains are dumb sometimes. And they don't always connect those dots in a way that is most helpful to you in order to help you repeat the behavior. So I wanna make sure that you take your time to notice the results of your hard work because doing so will increase your perception of reward. If you did the dishes and put them away, notice your empty sink because you noticed it when it was full, right? You noticed the pile. And you're like, oh, there's a huge pile of dishes in there. I'm such a lazy piece of crap for letting that happen. Okay, well, then you have to have a counter narrative for when you do those things. Then you have to notice that empty sink. You have to notice that cabinet full of clean dishes put away. And then you have to say to yourself, wow, I'm kind of a hard worker. Look what I did today. Look what I accomplished. Otherwise, it's all one-sided and you're sabotaging your own reward system. And another way that we sabotage our own reward system, this is something I'd like you to try to stop doing, is when we actually shame ourselves after completing the behavior. So how often do you do this, right? You've been, you've been procrastinating the laundry, the dishes for two, three days, maybe it's even a week or more, right? However long you've been trying to make yourself, trying to tell yourself to do this thing, when you finally do it, if your very first reaction, your next thought upon completion is, wow, I'm so lazy, that took me a week. What do you think that does to your perception of reward? It decreases it. Because you start to remember, our brains, they're kind of simple, okay? The parts of our brain that engage in emotional learning, which is what all this stuff is, dogs have that. Like, dolphins have that, chimps have that. Ours are not really that much more sophisticated or complicated than other mammals. This, other parts of our brain are. This part, not so much, okay? And we form associations. And if you shame yourself or guilt trip yourself or beat yourself up or give yourself a hard time after you finish something, your brain links those things. And your brain says, I don't wanna do that. People are mean to me when I do that. That's how it will feel on the inside. That's how our brains work. So do not shame yourself after you get something done. I know what you're trying to do. I know you're trying to punish the procrastination that came before the behavior. That's not how your brain will interpret it. Your brain will interpret it as, I got punished for doing the dishes. Why do I wanna do the dishes again now? I don't. Next time I'm gonna procrastinate it even more just to show that jerk who is you, unfortunately, just, just, just teach them a lesson. Just to show them they can't push me around, they can't tell me what to do. Well, now you're stuck fighting with yourself, and that sucks. The other set of interventions we can use to try to engage in a behavior more consistently is to decrease our perception of effort. Basically, this lowers the barrier of entry into the behavior. So the easier it feels to get started or to do it, the more likely we are to do it, right? Even if that reward isn't that high, if the effort is low, it still feels worth it. And we can pretty easily do that thing over and over and over again. Some of the ways that you can decrease your perception of effort of, of a behavior are challenge, rigidity, or perfectionism. This is probably gonna be a big one because so many people who struggle with depression and anxiety are perfectionists. These things tend to go very hand in hand. We don't completely know why yet, but they do. There's a saying that good is the enemy of great. And, and I think there can be some truth to that. But I also think that perfect is the bully of great. Meaning that if you're aiming for perfectionism, if you're telling yourself, this thing has to be so immaculate and on point, it has to be beyond reproach, I have to do this like to a T, 100% A plus work. Well, you've now created a very high barrier to entry. Because if you don't feel able to execute that thing perfectly at any given time, you're not even gonna to wanna to start it then. Because it's gonna feel like I can't do it as good as I need to do it, so why do it at all? So challenging those perfectionistic urges you have in your mind and telling yourself 
it is more important to simply do this thing and do it reasonably well than to do it, quote, perfectly. And having these super high standards is actually going to hold me back from doing this thing. It's going to prevent me from accomplishing this task. It's going to be a barrier to me living the kind of life that I want to live. Perfectionism is not your friend when you're trying to build habits and routines. It is your enemy, it is your bully, and it will stop you dead in your tracks every time. Another way that you can decrease your perception of effort and challenge perfectionism is to set a time limit. So often we have these big things we're trying to do and, and we put them in our heads or put them on our to-do lists like a single bullet point, like clean the basement. Like, that's like 15 different things probably, right? That's a lot of tasks that you're combining into one. So if you say, rather than, I have to finish that, that makes it a very black and white proposition, right? I either do it or I don't. What if you just said, I'm gonna clean for 10 minutes, you know? I, when you set a time limit, it dramatically decreases your perception of effort because you know exactly how long you have to do this thing for for it to be considered a success. Whereas if you don't have a time limit, it just feels like this big nebulous thing, like, well, who knows how long that could take? That could take hours. And that's gonna make it so much harder for you to wanna start. Because you might think, do I have hours? Do I even have that much time? Or do I have enough energy to do something that takes that long? Time limits are super helpful towards decreasing that effort threshold and getting started on a behavior. A very similar principle, but different enough that it warrants kind of its own bullet point here is to break large things down into smaller tasks. So again, cleaning the basement is an example, right? What if I just said dust the basement? That's now a much more contained activity. That's a much narrower range of things I must do. And so I don't need to feel as motivated or as excited or as gung-ho about doing this thing if that is all I have to do rather than the whole thing. Now, just like with both these things, breaking things down and time limits, no one says you have to stop because getting started is usually the hardest part. Once you cross that threshold from contemplation into action, often you can stay in action indefinitely. You can often just keep doing the thing, but sometimes you have to trick yourself a little bit to get started. And these are two ways you can do that. One last strategy for decreasing perception of effort, make sure that it's accessible. Like whatever the thing you're trying to do is, make sure that it's as easy to do or as easy to get to as possible. So to give you a personal example of this, something I used to struggle with being consistent on, this is silly, but it's, it's a good example, was trimming my hedges, like literally the ones outside my house, right? And my hedge trimmer was in this really awkward spot in my garage. It was kind of buried under a bunch of other stuff and it seemed like no matter when I put it away or like where I put it, it always ended up buried. And so anytime I thought about like, oh, I should go trim the hedges today, I first had to solve this additional problem of like, I have to find and possess my hedge trimmer because it's in a difficult spot to access. And after about a year of just basically getting really frustrated with this whole thing, I bought these racks where you can just kind of hang your um, like yard appliances from. And so it was literally just right next to the door. And that made a huge difference because this task went from like a, a two stage task essentially to a one stage. It's literally hanging right there. I pick it up, I walk out the door, I'm ready to work. So think about things that you're trying to make yourself do more often. How accessible are they? Are they easy to get to? Do you have to work before you can even start the work? Because if you do, that's gonna make it a lot harder for you to start the work. That increases your perception of effort and it raises that threshold, which is the opposite of what we wanna to do to build consistency in a behavior. Okay, so one last quick idea before we wrap up for today. You can use this exact same principle that we've been talking about this whole time to decrease the frequency of a behavior if there's something you want to do less of. It works both ways. So if there's something you're trying to stop doing, if you decrease your perception of reward and or increase your perception of effort, you can get that to something that's very difficult for you to do. Something you have to exert willpower to do rather than something you do automatically. So basically take everything I just said and flip it around 
and you can stop yourself from doing things. Let's take a few examples. If you are somebody who is struggling with some type of overeating, you likely, this is not true for everybody, but this is true I think something like 80% of the time, you are probably pairing your eating behavior with something else pleasurable, which is one of the things that I suggested that you do if you're trying to inc increase your perception of reward, right? If you eat while you're watching TV or while you're watching YouTube or reading, you have paired eating with another pleasurable stimuli. And so when you think about eating, your brain isn't just thinking about eating, it's thinking about eating plus this other thing, and that increases the perception of reward and it makes you wanna do that thing more often. So if you decouple your individual behaviors from these other things you've added onto them, you're less likely to do them. And if that's a behavior you want to stop, breaking it apart and, and detaching it from these other rewards that it's become connected to can help you stop doing it. This one might sound kind of silly, but you can also do a similar trick with perfectionism. So we talked about challenging perfectionism, right? Challenging high expectations to try to get yourself to start doing something. Well, if you wanna stop doing something, what if you raised your expectations? So what if, let's say you're struggling with gambling, okay? What if before the next time you went gambling, you said to yourself, I have to quadruple my money every time I go out or I'm a failure. Like take the same kind of thought process that gets stuck in your mind for the practical logistical things you try to do, the thing that is the barrier, and put it in place for problem behaviors. What if you were a perfectionist about that or shopping? right? I have to find the most perfect pair of pants or I will not buy anything. Take that perfectionistic mindset that is normally your enemy and put it to good use on things you're trying not to do. And what that's going to do is it's going to increase that barrier to entry and your brain is going to be like, oh man, I'm not sure if I can do that today. Maybe I don't want to go shopping today. Maybe I don't want to gamble today. Because suddenly this sounds like a high performance situation and that makes it a lot less fun and a lot less enjoyable. So that's just a couple quick examples. You could deconstruct the whole thing I just said, obviously, and just invert everything. But you can help yourself stop or decrease problem behaviors by increasing the perception of effort or decreasing the perception of reward. Modifying those two variables is ultimately the key to controlling your behavior. It's not willpower. So many people think it's willpower. Willpower is finite and willpower is finicky. In other words, no one has infinite willpower. No one can just run on willpower forever. And it really like ebbs and flows quite a bit from one day to the next. It's not consistent and it's not something you can count on. What you can count on is that you're a mammal and you're a reward driven mammal with an emotional learning system. And if something feels more rewarding to do, than the amount of effort it takes to do it, then you're gonna naturally wanna do that thing over and over and over.